And I think there is this idea that while the civil rights movement achieved formal equality, that wasn't enough. And you could also say second wave feminism has a similar character. Women had achieved formal equality in first wave feminism, but that was insufficient. So we need second wave feminism, kind of difference feminism. And similarly, civil rights achieved formal equality, but it was insufficient, and so we need black power. As Adolf Fried said, the gay movement came along to just be a photocopy of these other preceding movements. Um, and we could say, you know, as Biden did when he was uh, vice president under Obama, that trans rights is the civil rights movement of the 21st century. But again, what does that mean? Does it mean formal equality or does it mean equity? Because after all, formal equality is one thing, you know, maybe the Republicans can go for that. But no, you have to actively attack cisgender heteronormativity. Welcome to the Catrone Zone again. Uh, it is your weekly time to become Catrone pilled. We'll be divvying those out, distributing them. And uh, with me today, as always, is the last Marxist, your track coach, genius, Chris Catrone. Um, Chris, thanks for coming back on again, as always, and uh, glad to talk to you today. I do. Good. Yeah, I want to talk to you about, you sent me a couple of essays that are in your book, Marxism and Politics, which is available now, by the way, although the ebook needs to be uploaded to the website and made available uh, as soon as possible. Um, and I will be creating an audiobook version sooner rather than later. Uh, but uh, yeah, this was a very interesting piece, the Shinasri, a critique of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Uh, what what year did this originally get published? It's like 2000. It's pretty early on. I feel like it's, uh, is it 2011? Mm. It's like, it's, uh, or 2010 even. Um, it's pretty early on. It's in the Obama, early Obama years. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like it's before Occupy Wall Street. Right. Okay. So 2010 or, yes. or, or, or early 2011. Right. Yeah. It, you know, this was, this was the moment after the economic crisis of 2008 where the, well, where Marxism returned. And in different in, intellectuals attempted to usher in um, Marxist critique of capitalism again. And but really what happened was all these people who were already doing that kind of work were elevated by the moment. So like David Harvey and Zizek and so on. Um, and, and Richard Wolff became yes. went from obscurity into celebrity. Capitalism against um, the fan. Yes, exactly. That was that was probably the most mainstream hit, I think, that came out of for Marxists that came out of the 2008 crisis. But one of the things that came out of that at that time um, was the notion of a communist horizon. Um, you had people like Slavoj Zizek and uh, Jody Dean and Alain Badu and uh, others. Um, that were involved in sort of pushing, I think Frederick Jameson was maybe even of somewhat aligned mm -hmm. with this notion of uh, the need to reconsider and revive communism. The idea of communism. Yep. Right. And so that's what your essay is partly about. It's also about the RCP mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and the bringing them together was really quite interesting to me. I want to start by just asking you who, um, the uh, SASQ you were responding to actually is David uh, Bolot. Is that how he's? Oh, David Bolot. Yeah, I begin with him because he was he was actually a member of Platypus, so he was a grad student at the University of Chicago at the time that Platypus got started, and um, he did an anthropology of finance capital. He did a study of BlackRock, but he published. Speaking of Richard Wolff. He published an essay in Rethinking Marxism, which is Richard Wolff's uh, journal, um, uh, against equality or beyond equality. Um, I think the original the original uh, title was Against Equality, and then it became Beyond Equality. Um, and he was going to follow it up with Beyond Freedom. 
uh, I don't think that he ever did realize that essay. Um, but I used it as an opening ambit because at this time, the RCP USA, uh, the old New Left Maoists, um, had changed their orientation from very different from like when you and I would have encountered them in the 1980s. Um, where at protest demos, they would do things like uh, get into scuffles with the police and this kind of thing. So they had a new orientation towards intellectuals. And they had what they called the new synthesis. So Bob Avakian, their leader, but also others in the leadership had crafted this new synthesis. And uh, it seemed to be of the same moment as what we were just talking about, the, the communist hypothesis, the idea of communism, um, that collection, that book that came out, and, and various other books around that. Um, I have another piece, The Marxist Hypothesis, that's a direct response to um, Badu's uh, original article, The Communist Hypothesis. But um, they had basically decided that you needed a new understanding of the relationship of Marx, Lenin, and Mao. Also Stalin, but really Marx, Lenin, and Mao. So that's the new synthesis. The new synthesis was a new understanding of the contributions of Marx, Lenin, and Mao. And uh, Bolat's piece um, really was about Marx as a kind of scientific socialist as rather than a moralistic socialist. And it was pitched against the idea that the bottom line with communism was equality. So the touchstone with Alain Badu, but also Zizek, Jody Dean, and uh, also the new synthesis of uh, the Bob Vakian's RCP was communism equals radical democratic equality. And if, if we also, you know, tease it out more because I have some other, another piece by Bedu. So the idea that um, we're not Marxists so much as we're communists and what that distinction is about. And, you know, it is traceable back to the new left cultural revolution moment, you know, like new left Maoism, because there are really two phases to Maoism. One is the 56 Sino-Soviet split Maoism, old left Maoism, we could call it. And then there's new left Maoism that's really about the Cultural Revolution. And that's the one that's had more of an impact. And that's the one that people like Badu was truly, really trying to make sense of. I feel like Zizek was along for the ride. I don't know, you know, I don't think that that's very central to Zizek so much as he was along for the ride. And if you recall at that time, Zizek was really upholding Badu as the ultimate philosopher of this. Right. No, like Zizek was getting some cred by being associated with Badu. Uh, within a few years, Badu being older and, and not so well, and for a variety of other reasons, became maybe less interesting to people than Zizek. Uh, although I don't know, in academic circles, it may have been Badu was more reputable and more highly esteemed all along. But um, it's worth noting that, that I mean, the fact that he that David Bolat was part of Platypus for a little while mm -hmm. um, is striking. He's at Essex now, right? Mm -hmm. And and he seems like a he seems like a quite impressive figure mm -hmm. um, in terms of just everyday kind of worldly success. Mm -hmm. He is um, listed here as the faculty's director for financial services. Mm. And he's leading the transformation of clients' core business using AI in the UK and internationally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so he's gone into the industry that he studied in some ways. Mm -hmm. Previously, he led and launched analytic functions at Barclays and the Bank of England. Right. So, so it. I mean, you know, you 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 you're working in the Department of Economics, visiting fellow, and mm. making a living, and you know. Consulting, I guess he's some sort of consultant based on this. I don't know. Right, right. But, but yeah. So yeah, you're going to follow the whatever the trends are. AI is a big thing. Sure, put that on there. Um, but there's, it's not as though when you look him up, you would think, oh, Marxist or communist. 
right? That that doesn't read as communist today, right? So so I'm not sure if that's worth noting or not, but mm -hmm. um, but I want to go back to your piece. Um, uh -huh. you in your uh, essay, um, I'm going to see if I can pull that up as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you 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 go into Rousseau, you know, in uh the. Yep. Sublation Magazine Parrot Room, we've been discussing Rousseau. We've been reading The Social Contract most recently. Uh -huh. And um, I'm so I'm very interested in, in Rousseau. So I guess I want to ask you just a question about Rousseau that was that you brought up at the beginning of your essay that I want a clarification on, just for my own edification. Mm -hmm. Regarding Rousseau, what did he mean when he claimed that there was no such thing as inequality in nature, but only differences? And to what extent does his claim rely on an assumption of a natural man living a solitary life or a concept? Right. So, right. So in nature, there is no inequality, only differences. Um, now, that would appear to be the way he describes it. This is in the discourse on the origin of inequality or the second discourse. So, um, you know, he wrote in response to an essay question posed for a competition. You know, um, what is the origin of inequality and is it authorized by nature? And that's why he had to say the origin of inequality is society, not nature. And it's not, not authorized by nature. So he's arguing against um, a kind of great chain of being, kind of uh, hierarchy of creation in God's creation idea that just as there is a hierarchy in nature and even in the celestial sphere, there's a hierarchy of angels. There's also a hierarchy in, in among humans. And what Rousseau says is, well, in nature, there is no hierarchy. Like is a bear superior to a sparrow? No, each occupies their own ecological niche. And so they're, they're really not in a state of hierarchy. They're in a state of uh, different ways of surviving. Right. So they coexist. That's the other thing is that, you know, there is no hierarchy. There is no subordination. There's coexistence among different species. And that basically the argument is that Yes, humans are not all the same, but that doesn't mean that they're unequal. Right? So basically arguing against any kind of natural basis for inequality and saying that its origin is social. The, the way he does it in um, the discourse on social inequality on, or on inequality um, is by positing that each person in a state of nature is able to live uh, from the natural, live off the natural world independently, right? And therefore, in a state of nature, there's not a society or there's the social relations are not uh, materially necessary for the reason. It's a speculative um, thought. So it's a thought experiment. And so um, uh, the way that I like to put it, you know, I teach this academically. And so the way that I like to put it is that there are social animals, but humans are the political animal and the zoo on Politicon, Aristotle, meaning that unlike animals, which live in natural communities and natural groups, we live in what we would call a social community or social groups and what Aristotle would call a political community, a, you know, a, po a polis. And so, you know, because Rousseau is steeped in the classics. You know, he's an Enlightenment thinker, steeped in, in classical philosophy, also in modern philosophy. And, uh, you know, so he's sort of synthesizing a great deal. And even Aristotle recognized that human communities are different from natural communities. So we're not merely a social animal because we are that there are many species of social animal, but we're unique as the political animal. And what that means is that we create communities that are not natural communities. Right. And so you don't have to, because one of the objections that people in the uh, parrot room would raise, I think Wendy raised it even last, last time 
was that, oh, look, I know from anthropology, I know from what little reading I've done that human beings never lived uh, as isolated individuals, but we're always in And he certainly knew that. That's the other thing that we have to be clear about. It's not like Rousseau didn't know that. There, a great deal was already known. I mean, a great deal is discovered in the 19th century, but a great deal is already known in the 18th century about anthropology. So he says it's a thought experiment. You know, this you know, lone wolf conception of the human individual is a thought experiment. And he says... The only point of this thought experiment is to cast society into sharp relief. In other words, to say everything that we assume about society should be questioned and interrogated and should not be understood as natural. So if you, if you say, okay, well, humans are a social species, you're always going to be tempted to say, well, we're still living in the same social animal group that we've always been in as a species. And, you know, alpha males, beta males, right? Alpha dog, right? It might just be in our nature to have this hierarchy. And, and Rousseau's rejecting it. Naturalize our social relations. Exactly. And he's saying because if, because if we imagine um, humanity relating only to nature, this is one way to imagine it. And it's a thought mm -hmm. experiment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So I just want to bring that forward. Um, but... Uh, the, my my next question then is what is an imminent critique because right. um, what you um, are arguing in your piece is that Rousseau and his conception of the social character of inequality and his uh, striving after freedom and his understanding of freedom um, all of these things uh, should be critiqued if you're a Marxist uh, imminently and I think that uh, Bolat is is failing to to engage that. on that level. So do that. That's right. That was my criticism. That's right. I mean, I was sort of you know gently using his piece as an example, as a kind of a symptom of something that was in the air. Um, and so, in terms of like, all right. So maybe we should back up a second, like on the image critique. Meaning, what what is it that we're trying to critique? So yeah, I you know I wrote these questions down, and but maybe I shouldn't be reading them in the order I wrote them down as I read, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, so I guess the question should be, um, on uh, the, the the nature of what Bolat says uh, a, around the need to break from liberal conceptions of legal equality or formal equality. Um, what what is Bolat's uh, stance around uh, about these bourgeois uh, formal freedoms? Formal. That's the thing. So I feel like that was my criticism. My criticism was that um, Bolat was not. He was sort of taking some of Marx's rhetoric, which many Marxists do. They take some of Marx's rhetoric to be, oh, well, you know, liberty, equality, fraternity, these are kind of, or at least liberty and equality. Not fraternity so much. People don't say that because that's more associated with socialism, you know, solidarity. But liberty and equality are like bourgeois myths, right? And so it's bourgeois liberty, namely the liberty of like trade and commerce and property and this kind of thing and then equality but only the formal equality of you know the contractual agreement rather than substantial equality right and you know and i of course disagree with that entire framework for approaching things and i i think it's actually at odds with marx but plausibly, one can point to rhetoric of Marx to say that he well, he says exactly that, that this all this liberty and equality stuff in bourgeois terms is just bullshit. And 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 also, you know, what Bolat was really zeroing in on was like the critique of the Gotha program, where Marx says, look, equal right is bourgeois right, and we're not really striving for equal right. So from each according to his ability to each according to his need is actually not equality. It's beyond equality, right? Um, and, you know, our generation, but even the millennials, like someone like David Bolat, you know, they really are very hung up on postmodernism. And postmodernism is, you know, skeptical about um, 
equality and and very skeptical about universalism mm -hmm. and very uh in favor of difference right and so you can find marx saying well human beings are different they have different needs they have different capacities and so this whole equality thing is just bourgeois claptrap and mystification you know and you know i mean this is what many marxists will say and they'll say it's not materialist like the whole notion of equality and freedom these are idealisms mm -hmm. you know and and then what are we left with well fraternity but why right why what would the basis of, of solidarity be oh it would be like the collective interest of the workers against like capitalist private property or something it all sort of falls apart in a particular way or gives rise to all sorts of debates and paradoxes that i don't think are necessary so the Im imminence of it is that i think that marx is not as negative vis-a-vis -vis bourgeois values as people might surmise i agree with you one one thing i would point out is that um in the social contract book that rousseau wrote i believe I, i'm remembering this correctly um he spent some time uh overcoming the notion that might equals right and also yes. demonstrating the way in which yes we end up back at might equals right inadvertently like we'll make some claims that right appear to justify uh hierarchical or state authority or or the, the authority of a king or what have you but it ends up back to be a, a claim that whoever is strongest gets to rule or gets to say um and my problem with communists who emphasize fraternity over mm -hmm. anything else mm -hmm. is that ultimately they end up saying that the strength and power of the state mean justifies their insistence on conformity to their rule and to their their control I mean, and they say it in various ways. One way they might say it is, look at the economic miracle of China. Look how powerful China oh, has become, right, right. Mm -hmm. right? And and uh, and look at how, you know, and look at how many people were raised up out of poverty. Well, okay, that's true, but you know, if if you drop the notion of freedom from the realm of what the left should seek, and simply say what we want is to be well tended animals or slaves then perhaps it would be convincing to say well you know everyone's eating more calories a day now than they were 30 years ago yeah, or... yeah kind of naive utilitarianism and a kind of technocracy and then scientific socialism just becomes the better technocracy right which so, ultimately and... comes down to claiming that whoever has the most strength or power or might it has a, has the right i think I mean, they would never quite claim it that way, meaning like the Stalinist claims and, you know, would not be, you know, our right is based on our might. They would not. It would always be this kind of mealy mouthed, you know, it's like people's democracy, you know, or Soviet democracy, Soviet republicanism, you know, they'd always located in the working class. Mm hmm. It's a police state. It's a police state. So let's, um, yeah, so let's, like I said, let's, let's back it up a second. So I kind of feel like um, when you contacted me, you said you wanted to talk about the general will. Right. Uh-huh. Right. And so, you know, I bring in Rousseau primarily to say a couple of things. One is that he is the paradigmatic bourgeois radical thinker. And, you know, a kind of radicalizing moment of the enlightenment, of the bourgeois enlightenment of the 18th century. But that's not an enlightenment for the, like, the bourgeois class. It's, a, it's an enlightenment about bourgeois society, which includes the working class. The working class is bourgeois society. Um, and so, but the general will is maybe the more difficult concept of, of Rousseau's rather than the equality question, because it's the so-called totalitarian Rousseau. So there are these two Rousseau's. There's the anarchist Rousseau, and there's the totalitarian Rousseau. So there's the Rousseau who says, man is born free, but everywhere in chains, right? 
and who's very negative and skeptical, critical about any social relationship whatsoever, including between a man and a woman creating a family with children in common. You know, he's very negative about any interdependence whatsoever. Um, he problematizes that uh, in the discourse on the origin of inequality. Um, you know, and he makes certain claims. He says, like, slavery is only possible because the slave is dependent on the master. That if it was just a matter of the master overpowering the slave, it could never work. That the master has to make the slave dependent. So it's about problematizing dependence, interdependence, that aspect of society. And then he turns around in on the social contract and he says, uh, in fact, society has the right to put you to death if you go against it and society forces you to be free. And in, indeed, it's because you are the total creation of society. You're dependent on society. So if you go against society, you're going against yourself. And if you, you know, and that's one thing, but going against yourself and going against society in this way is going to harm other members of society. So society might have to put you to death. So that seems like the exact opposite of like the anarchist Rousseau, right? Um, but there aren't two Rousseaus. There are not. There's one Rousseau. And it's a dialectical conception of society. And that's what we have to really understand is that it's neither anarchist nor is it totalitarian. It's bourgeois. And yet in, in capitalism, capitalism seems like this strange two sides antinomy. It's like anarchism it's like you know uh i don't know anarchist libertarian anarcho-capitalism and it's totalitarian statism and you don't have to be in stalinism to have totalitarian statism in capitalism so it seems to be both of those things um and then rousseau sits very uncomfortably at the dawn of this birth of the society or at least the birth of the consciousness of the society because that's what we're really talking about we're talking about how Rousseau is not at the beginning of bourgeois society, he's actually at the end of bourgeois society. So the, the strictly Marxist understanding of this is a very Hegelian notion that bourgeois society comes to consciousness post-festum, after it's already happened. And that it's coming to like see itself for what it really is only at the end of the 18th century. So the um, and, you know, maybe the last holdout of a kind of drunk intoxication or sort of self-delusion about what it is, is the French Revolution. But it's still more prosaic because it's the Roman Republic and Roman Empire, which is different from earlier bourgeois thinkers, which thought that they were an, a, doing a rebirth of Christianity, right? Had this kind of like apostolic Christian, radical Protestant like very millenarian view of what bourgeois society was, you know, in the Dutch revolt, in the English civil war. And, you know, so of course, Marx thinks that the Jacobins are deluded. They are with their Roman Republicanism, but they're far less deluded than the early kind of Christian fundamentalist conception of bourgeois society. Well, okay. So I, and Rousseau um... is the beginning He's in the middle of the Enlightenment, but he's in the beginning of a kind of radicalization of this this self-consciousness of bourgeois society. Okay, I just want to mm -hmm. see if I understand and fully grasp, or at least grasp well enough, the notion of the general will. And mm -hmm. you can tell me with whether, whether or not I'm still mired in Christianity or have at least reached the level of the French Revolution in my thinking. Uh -huh. or, um <laughs> which is, uh, and it comes to me in the form of an anecdote. When I was a teenager, I was a member of the Unitarian Church, and I went to a youth retreat, and I met a girl. We ended up hitting it off, but uh, the way we hit it off originally was she asked me, she's kind of going around asking philosophical questions or, or theological questions to people, and uh, she asked me if I thought that it was better to uh, seek your own interest, to do what was best for yourself, 
or to serve others and be altruism. Uh, altruistic and to, and to you know do what was best for everyone else and you said and i said those two things are not opposed oh. the, the best way for you to do what is best is to understand what is best for yourself in relation to what is best for everyone else Kant's um, and, categorical imperative right so uh so therefore what is best for you when thought through, will be what is best for everyone. Everyone, did she like yeah. that answer? She did. That's uh, why I, uh, I, I, we, we had a nice time on the retreat. But the, but wait, the so point you hit is, it off. But the real question is, did you hit that? <laughs> <laughs> I Sorry, was Doug. sixteen. Sorry. I was. I, it was I, some. I, I, I'm going to say it was. I'm going to say for that. me at that time, yes. But the point is, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh. The, 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 the real um, question I have for you is, okay, so Kant's categorical imperative, is that the general will or is that not quite it? Is that the... It is. Um, and, you know, the problem there is that, of course, people assimilate that back to the golden rule. Right. Do unto others as you would do have them do to you. Yeah, but this is not... Okay, but none of this is the general will, actually. Right. It, it really isn't. Um, and uh, so the difficulty with the general will is, you know, if you really want to, like, get at it, mm -hmm. what Rousseau is talking about, um, it's best to start with Marx. Okay. And so Marx uh, talks about alienation, and it's a term from Hegel, Marx and alienation. So the 1844 manuscripts. Um and, you know, because I would say the general will is social relations. And Marx lays out the four kinds of alienation in the 1844 manuscripts. And he says, alienated from each other, alienated from nature, and alienated from ourselves. But then also alienated from the product of the production alienated from uh, the result of production. And in another spot, he says, there are two results of production. There's the article of consumption, that's the result of production. And then there's the social relation, that's the result of production. And it's that last one that we have to focus on. So Rousseau also talks about alienation, but Rousseau talks about it as a productive function of in in a very hegelian way actually as a kind of externalization and ob objectification and it's a kind of a self-alienation that then you return to yourself so it's a kind of alienation disalienation kind of dialectic we could say um so of course that would be my other point he like kant and hegel and marx the modern dialectic not the ancient socratic dialectic not heraclitus or any of that stuff the modern dialectic begins with Rousseau. Um, modern dialectics begin with Rousseau. And the, the, on the social contract, the very idea of a contract. So production, social production has two results, the article of consumption, but also the social relation of production. It's the contract itself. So the idea is that any social interaction is a contract and the contract has a result that transcends the interests of the contracting parties so when two people in society interact they're each acting out of self-interest but the result of their interaction is more than either of their self-interest that's the general will. It's the will of the contract itself. The idea that the individual wills of the contracting parties are transcended by the will of the contract itself in the sense that that interaction and its implicit contract has a result that is greater than what the people going into it intend and want from it. It creates a social relation. Right. Okay, I mean, look, this is on the one hand quite familiar, of course, right? Um, 
On the other hand, um, I immediately find myself in a way retreating into Marx and like, oh, well, you know, there that that uh, I think about the invisible hand and then of uh, the market. The you know, the, the well. and, the, and it is. In other words, it is it is that. So the question is, how are we alienated from that in a negative, destructive way? Whereas someone like Smith or Rousseau, and Rousseau is building on, a, there's a guy, Bernard Mandeville, The Fable of the Bees, where Bernard Mandeville says, even a private vice, even the criminals contribute to society. Like, so what is a private vice is a public benefit and public virtue. So everyone is selfish, acting out of self-interest. Everyone's greedy. But the result is greater than that. It's a very poor idea to bourgeois society, and it's it's positive, it's productive, it's emancipatory. Until in capitalism, it also becomes destructive. So that's that's the thing. So what starts out as like a, a positive alienation becomes a negative alienation, a constructive, productive alienation that brings us out of ourselves and elaborates our capacities as humans in society becomes destructive of that very thing, right? So the idea that capitalism is a self-destructive social relation and therefore self-alienated in, in that sense, um, you know, I, I had a debate uh, actually in the book. I have um, some of my writings from the debate that I had with Dick Howard and Leo Panitch. And um, at a certain point, you know, we're talking about what is capitalism? And, uh, you know, it was a platypus panel. And uh, Dick Howard was like, you guys are talking about capitalism and capital as if it's a thing. You're forgetting it's a social relation. And I said, well, no, I'm not forgetting that. But you might forget that it's not a social relation. It's a contradiction and crisis of the social relation. The social relation is the bourgeois social relation of the associated producers, cooperative labor. And then the crisis of that is capital, right? That's the point. Okay, so for most of my time understanding Marx, I would understand all of this only really in terms of the tendency of the rate of profit to decline. Like that that would be the contradiction, right? That That's a manifestation. You, the phenomenon. Right. You, yes. you, you are, um, you're meant to create a surplus. Your individual greed comes together and produces more than either one could on its own. And you create a society of abundance, but for the tendency of the rate of profit to, to cl decline. But how does this work out politically? What, what, how, or how is this understood socially okay. and politically? Right. So, um, but let's stick with the social contract and the general will just for a moment, because I think. Okay, yeah, I'm not trying to. To grasp. Right. I, I'm like, thinking um, of it as political. The general will is being political, or. Well, it's the basis of politics, right? So that's the idea. So he brings up the general will. So it is core. It's the central category of his discussion of the social contract. The idea that the contract itself has a will, of its own, and so you know. Just to lay it out very, very uh, clearly, it's not the majority will. It's also not the aggregate will. So what he says is that if you add up all the individual wills and you get the social aggregate will and then you subtract them all again, what's left over is the general will. He has this funny kind of mathematical like uh, little image or metaphor. It doesn't make sense mathematically. But it, but that's what he says. He says you add it all up and then you subtract it all out, and what's left is the general will. So it's not the majority will, and it's not the aggregate will. It's again what um, what Kant and Hegel would call the, the transcendental property of it. I mean, it's Hegelian Geist. It's Hegelian Geist, and it is it is Smith's Invisible Hand. Although the reason I mentioned Bernard Mandeville is that people think that Smith originated this idea of the Invisible Hand. Actually, it's Mandeville, right? So Smith just invokes it, but Smith is really uh, elaborating Rousseau, 
Smith is a Rousseauian, a radical Rousseauian in the way that Kant and Hegel are. So I always like to say Kant's only portrait on his wall in his, in his uh, study is Rousseau. And he credits Rousseau with making him have his epiphany and his critical turn in philosophy is from Rousseau. That Rousseau answers the question of why Hume is wrong. So if I am trying to understand what Rousseau means by taking the aggregate of all the wills and what people want, like let's say a poll, what do you want? And then subtracting that and coming up with Geist, the only thing I can imagine at that point is I sort of just <laughs> have to shrug at that. And then I think, okay, well, what did uh, Hegel mean by Geist? And it, and it had to do with what would emerge from self-reflection and the uh, examination of contradictions through self-reflection um, and the development of, I, of... Geist is what allows the reflection. So it's not that... So Geist doesn't arise from reflection. That would be more the Marxist understanding of what Geist is. In other words, Geist uh, for, for Hegel would be the development, the movement, and then the non-self-identity of that movement that creates the possibility of reflection at all, creates the possibility of consciousness at all. Right? Yeah, that but we're when not you reach Geist, ourselves. when you reach, when your own self-reflection and the self-reflection of society reaches Geist, then uh, there will be a realization that Geist and society are uh, the same through their difference. Speculative identity. Yeah, it's a speculative identity. So I think that here's a couple of quotations, right? So the question is, is the general will, the general will is a characterization of bourgeois society. That's true. However, for Rousseau, he thinks that there was always a general will, that the Paleolithic peoples, the totemic species, tribal communities, the hunter-gatherers, they have a general will. And, you know, European, like Christendom in the feudal era had a general will. Like, it's kind of like every, every community has a general will, right? So it's, 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 it is a trans-historical property. Again, it's a zoon politicon. In other words, um, it's, it's, again, the idea of a social contract at all. Like, the idea is that any human community in the sense of zoon politicon and not a social animal has a general will. And the general will changes. That's the real point. The real point is that unlike a social community, meaning the beavers have been doing what they're doing, the ants and the bees have been doing what they're doing for millions of years, the general will of the zoon politicon, of the human community, changes historically, develops, transforms itself, and it does so through its own action. In other words, the general will is self-transformative. That's Geist. Right. And then because it's in a process of development and self-transformation, that is what allows, because human nature can change itself and it does so in society, not in nature. That is the possible, that's the source of consciousness reflection. Actually, Rousseau talks about this. He actually does talk about like what makes us conscious in a way that the animals are not. And it's precisely our transformability which takes place in society, meaning it, it, it's based on some basic fun, fungible qualities of human nature, but ultimately it happens in society. It doesn't happen in nature. It happens in society. That's why he famously says we, we sacrifice natural liberty for moral freedom, right, in society. Um, you could say natural liberty for social freedom. And, you know, and so society is the source of our freedom. It's the source of our unfreedom, right? It's the product of our freedom. And our unfreedom is also the product of our freedom. That's the connection between the two texts, between the, the, so, the social contract and the discourse and the origin of inequality is that, and he calls that reason, you know, very Hegelian, reason. So reason is both the source and the product of our freedom. Freedom is both the source and the product of our reason. And both of these are the origins of our unfreedom. 
and of our irrational social systems, right? It's a very optimistic view in the sense that um, everything that we suffer from in society is our own doing, and therefore we can get out of it. Right. So um, right. I want to go back into your text, kind of maybe this will seem a bit at random, but you wrote that um, Althusser found in the mm -hmm. Russian and Chinese revolutions a solitary challenge to the notion of a Hegelian logic of history, that revolutionary change could and indeed did happen as a matter of contingency. And to be clear, it was Althusser, not Hegel, who believed revolution could be happening as a matter of contingency. Would you mm -hmm. say that Althusser, at that, by making that claim, was was uh, abandoning the notion of the general will, abandoning the notion of the social responsibility for changes that occurred uh, in society and that, that we suffered from and was uh, instead kind of retreating to a claim that inequality was natural in some way? In some way. I mean, it, that's not, not Althusser's intention. It really hinges, with Althusser, it hinges on um, materialism, right? So the question is, well, what does Althusser think materialism means? Um, and I do think that it's based on a kind of pre-Socratic notion that uh, the material world changes, right? And, and our, you know agency comes as a function of that more spontaneous change that happens in nature. And that's where, uh, you know, the problem with Hegel in the 20th century is that Hegel could be used to justify what happened historically. Meaning, you know, Stalinism, we could say, was a reversion of Marxism into a kind of right Hegelianism, a kind of affirmative Hegelianism, a kind of rationalization of what happens. So, you know, Hegel himself dealt with the question of necessity and contingency. He did. But Althusser was not happy with that because it seemed to really dodge the issue of um, change that is not logical and doesn't have a linear progressive character to it. You know, so the, the piece by Althusser that's maybe most apposite on this is uh, contradiction and overdetermination. And it's, it's important to note that overdetermination is a Lacanian idea. Althusser is a Lacanian. And that there is a kind of pre-Socratic philosophical, like as filtered through like Nietzsche and Heidegger, that's the basis of this and really discontent with the Hegelian dialectic, and also a discontent with a Kantian and Rousseauian dialectic as well, because it seems to, uh, it could seem too deterministic, it could seem too um, optimistic, too affirmative of what happens, right? It's, it's you know, basically, uh, I think the way Althusser addresses it uh, around the Russian and Chinese revolutions is, well, these are eruptions from the flow of history and not just logical outcomes of the flow of history. So I think that's the concern, as if Hegel only gives us an account of necessity, as if Hegel only gives us an account of a kind of logical progress of history, which Hegel wasn't trying to do. Hegel said, this is all in retrospect. It must appear to us that way in the present, post festum, after the fact. But of course, it's not that. Um, meaning, you know, there is no like line of history in, in, in its own movement. You know, there are periods of history, progression, you know, if if you take up a concept like necessity and treat it in a Hegelian way, I mean, I I haven't read um, the phenomenology of spirit for quite a while. I'm not all the way through the, the science of logic, but my my guess would be he's going to he's going to come up in science of logic. Yeah, he's going to demonstrate Go that you cannot take up 
the notion of necessity without also bringing in the idea of contingency and that these things are mutually supporting and that the that the that their determination to determine contingency and necessity together will lead you to i would guess some other concept it would be a necessary concept that would be coming out of your logical determination of a contradiction in your concepts but it would not be um only a necessary like in the sense of we we usually mean necessary uh result it would be a uh, result of understanding the the mutual dependence of contingency and necessity um in reflection as concepts or the dialectic of necessity and freedom right i think engels has a formulation that um people have abused what is freedom freedom is contingency the should not be equated with freedom you can't replace the, the word uh, you can't you can't but most people do associate them meaning what is what is within our scope of action what is under our control what do we have some agency in oh it must be in what is contingent rather than what is necessary yeah well no i mean look that's not right at all i mean i just saw yesterday on twitter uh a, a photo it was a video of actually of someone discovering a beaver who had been chopping mm -hmm. down a tree and as it, it cut all the way through the tree, uh, it shifted and fell on his head and stayed there and smashed his head open and killed so that there was this dead beaver with a tree trunk on his head because he, the, by mere contingency, he was killed by that process. So if he had had a better grasp of what was necessary, the physics of, of cutting down the tree, he would have had the freedom to cut down that tree without being killed. So the contingency was an absolute limit on his freedom, the contingency of that moment, right? That he certainly wasn't intending to have the tree branch, the tree fall on his head. I'm not sure if my example makes sense, but you know, if we just it sort does of stuck make at sense the level of that, right. So I think that um I I would say that we need a different notion of freedom also than just scope of action or you know um, we need a, a more, again, Hegelian or dialectical conception of freedom in which we have the transformation of necessity, meaning it's not just, okay, do you have this menu of choices available to you? It's rather how that transforms the conditions, right? So it's not just Pepsi or Coke or Democrat or Republican or, you know, or Green Party, you know, it's not like a binary choice or a trinary choice. You know, it's not just a menu of choices that we have. It's not like freedom should not be understood to be just that, like a scope of action or a choice of alternatives, but should be our ability to transform our conditions. And our conditions are necessary, meaning that they exist, you know. <laughs> I mean... Maybe I'm being simple-minded here, but if we were, without understanding uh, the ne necessity of physical life, we would never have been able mm. to develop the capacity to fly an airplane, which was a, ma a massive mm -hmm. change in, the, in what we were capable of doing in the realm of contingency, or right? Mm. Is that... I mean, it's a little bit too, it's a little bit too, you know, I think that's a little bit too practical scientific. It's, it's, you know, let's, let's get back to the, the deeper question of society, which is, you know, Rousseau's question, which is why would these animals, we are animals, homo sapiens, why would we ever act against our instincts? Ever. And yet we do all the time. Right? We, we, we do things that are bad for us all the time. Um, in terms of like, you know, we act against our physical, biological, natural self-interest all the time. You know, meaning, yeah, we invented airplanes, Doug. That also means that we invented jet crashes. You know, right? So, like, you know, like, in other words, like, you know, humans, there, there are a million ways to die in the Old West, right? And, you know, 999,999 of them were invented by humans. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so, right. And so, um, you know, like, I mean, obviously not, but you know, you, you get my point. And, um, you know, so it's for good or for ill, you know, we could have just stayed animals and, you know, we would have fulfilled our natural necessity a lot better, but we would not have been free. I guess people think the animals are, <laughs> but they're not. Rousseau's basic point is that the animals are not free because they're bound by their physical natural necessity, whereas humans transcend their physical natural necessity while still fulfilling, right? So transcendence in the Hegelian sense of you can't transcend unless you fulfill. Right. I mean, I've had this argument with um, John Bunch, who's one of the investors in Sublation, uh, many times, and he is ac absolutely adamant that no, humans have no more freedom and are, are as bound by necessity This is a superstition. any other animal. This is just a superstition. This is theology. This is not philosophy. This is not politics. This is theology masquerading as science, which, by the way, a lot of science is theology masquerading as science. A lot. You ever remember, do you remember the book, The the Naked Ape? Have you ever heard of that book? Uh-huh. Yeah, and from the 70s, it's like thinking about human Sociobiology. beings. Sociobiology. Yeah, right. And it was a pop in, published by um, the uh, Playboy, by the way. Like a Hugh, Hugh Hefner had a hand in publishing The Naked Ape because, you know, Ooh, naked. But anyway, but yeah, um, yeah, it was a popular idea. Uh, the theology, this religion, was popular in the period of the New Left in the sixties and seventies um, mm -hmm. and beyond. Kurt Vonnegut wrote um, Galapagos, uh -huh. which was a, a story of after a nuclear war, humanity devolved back into just being ac animals because it was no longer necessary for them to have these big cerebral cortexes and all these ideas and they were all very much happier yeah that be bad for survival absolutely no that's true i mean you know, in terms of natural selection and darwinian you know evolution it could be that uh really in the end the most you know uh fittest form of life might be the bacteria at the bottom of the ocean around the uh, underwater volcanoes that I think, you know, because they, they survive in the most hostile environment. So it doesn't matter what happens to the earth. It can be smashed by asteroids. It can be nuked. It can, you know, have a gamma ray, you know, bathing um, event. Um, you know, that bacteria is going to be there. Okay. Right. So obviously, um, when we get into that, then we're getting into more, more like Manichaean, like theology of like order and chaos, you know, like the two principles of the universe, you know, like, uh, you know, kind of breakdown, spontaneous breakdown, entropy and spontaneous order, you know, and, you know, order out of chaos and that kind of thing. And, and, you know, I'm sure that people think that Hegel has something to say about that. But leaving that to one side, rather than thinking about it being in the nature of our matter, because, by the way, that's where Badu went following Althusser. He went in the direction of a kind of Epicurean, like, atomic material notion of contingency, the swerve. It's the philosophy of the swerve. You know, the worlds come into being because atoms falling through space suddenly swerve and combine. Right. And this is a so-called right. left philosophy without without a notion of freedom. Yeah, right. Because it doesn't give us our kind of agency in terms of like deliberate action. You know, rather, rather it gives us a kind of almost stoic kind of like we have to accept the changes that occur. And, you know, and be true to them in some way. And, uh, you know, again, for me, I see this as plainly ideological, meaning plainly a kind of despair at the failure of, like, the proletarian socialist project. You know, and uh, so the idea being that, well, after the failure of the proletarian socialist project, are we going to sink back into despair, resignation, pessimism, or are we going to pay attention to the random changes that happen? 
and try to be true to them. Right. And I feel like, well, actually that's the despairing pessimistic, you know, um, that at least something happens, right. At least October 7th happens, you know, no, seriously. It's on the same, it is treating it as a natural phenomenon. It is treating it as a natural phenomenon. And I, and I feel like, well, okay. So, but again, getting back to the general will, because I think it bears on the struggle for socialism, actually. Namely, um, no one with deliberation created society. Like there was no moment in which people got together and signed a social contract. That's really Rousseau's point. And that's where he's arguing against Hobbes, certainly. And, and also he's radicalizing Locke. So the big difference between Hobbes and Locke is actually around might makes right versus property rights based on labor. So uh, Hobbes, basically the war of all against all, I think is a depiction of feudalism. It's a depiction of the aristocracy, the feuding lords. The war of all against all doesn't refer to the peasants who engaged in cooperative labor, but it does refer to the lords and the emergence of a king to prevent perpetual warfare among the aristocratic warrior caste lords, right? The necessity of the absolute monarch above the aristocracy, that's Hobbes's argument in the Leviathan. And then Locke comes in and says, well, no, right? It's not might makes right, it's property makes right, and property is based on labor, so actually labor makes right. So it's a it's a bourgeois conception. It's also a revolutionary conception. Hobbes is a counter-revolutionary. Right. And and absolutism was sort of um closer to bourgeois society than what had come before. We we think of kings and queens and the absolute right and divine right of kings as being regressive, but it was a little closer. It was, but that that's a that's a more complicated point. So the more complicated point is that I think that the way Rousseau puts it is uh, people can give themselves a king, you know, but first they have to be a people, right? So meaning a monarchy is an expression of the general will. It's, it's an expression of the sovereignty of the general will. So general will, the other category that goes alongside it is sovereignty, by which he means self-determination of a community. So uh, the self-determination of the community that is driven by or guided by its general will is manifested in its political sovereignty, right? And that can take the form of a republic, it can take the form of a monarchy. Uh, now, here's another, another Mar Marx quote. Marx said, the secret of every constitution is democracy. Meaning a constitution of a monarchy, like I don't know, the Magna Carta, is not a democracy, but what what Marx was saying very much in a Rousseauian vein was that its its form is not democracy, but its content is. But that would be a kind of tribal democracy. It would be, you know, there was a time when kings were elected among the uh, feudal lords. So they elected a king above them, as opposed to a dynastic king that stood above the the aristocracy um now absolutism in that sense is a function of bourgeois society because the nascent bourgeoisie the workers and the proprietors the merchants got together and aligned with the monarch against the feudal lords out of mutual advantage and so that's you know, another important point to um, to recognize is that absolutism is not feudalism. It's the emergence of a kind of bourgeois state uh, in the sense of, you know, a kind of modern state that has a different content than the rule of the church and of the warrior caste. I mean, that's the other point that I would bring in his religion, which is the general will, again, in a very Hegelian sense. Um, that Hegel thought that Christianity was 
the manifest expression of a general will that actually pointed beyond it. So the idea that bourgeois society is a kind of secularized Christianity and transcends Christianity, but was the intention of Christianity, even though Christianity didn't know it. Right. So again, this kind of evolving movement of Geist, this transforming general will across history. Right. And then the form of sovereignty would change. The form of self-consciousness would change. The, the way that we reflect upon it, the way we grasp it would change. So we can't say, in a sense, every state is the adequate expression of the general will of the community. Every sovereign is, is by definition, otherwise they couldn't be sovereign. And so then if they, if they lose legitimacy, if they lose their sovereign power, it must be because the general will has abandoned them. Right? So uh, it's not about, it's not really about um, sanctifying or justifying the state. It can seem that way. But what Rousseau is doing is saying, he's, he's saying, what do we even mean by a social contract? If, you know, in the United States, we have this concept, but it goes back to the Enlightenment, goes back to like uh, Montesquieu, the consent of the governed. Right. What do we even mean by that? So, you know, the social contract theory as a, you know, there's a contract between the people and the state or the people and its government. Right. What does that even mean at a very basic level? And did it ever happen? Was there ever a moment? Because, you know, people are very naive. They think, oh, well, the U.S. Constitutional Convention was undemocratic because it was held in secret. And it's just these property owning, slave owning founding fathers. And, you know, it's their agreement among themselves. But, you know, it doesn't reflect the people. That's not the point whatsoever. Right. Um because actually the social contract in this sense as the general will, it's never deliberately decided and agreed upon. It rather spontaneously develops through our social interaction. So in a Marxist sense, you know, modes of production, successive modes of production, if we think about history as the progress in modes of production, the idea would be that the mode of production is itself a general will. Right. Meaning, I mean, to th yeah, like the way yeah. we think about the Constitution in the United States would be to say the this secret meeting happened to form the federal government and create the Constitution as a way at, springing out of the already existing relationships between workers and property owners and the and the world market in the United States. And so this is how that came together to, to, to perpetuate that mode of life. With or to, you know, like to, to create a form of government that was truest to that, that they thought was truest. To right. That. Yeah. No, that the intellectuals made an effort to meet the needs of the general the will. Yeah. Absolutely. The people. Right. And to the degree that they were, uh, they, they were right is the degree to which the people didn't didn't <clears throat> didn't overthrow them right right didn't right didn't organize right. A, another revolution um right. sure sure so okay but with just to, i want to say one more thing about zizek and badu and the communist horizon yes um because i i i feel like you're essay is really good and people should buy the book and they should look at, or look this up individually they can do that too um and we're going to talk about your essay some more in the second half because like just in and of itself mm -hmm. it deserves to be worked out rather than this philosophical conversation but um i want to say like with the communist horizon that came up which was a way to skirt around rousseau skirt around the even the notion of the general will to uh, return to the notion that inequality was natural, at least in Badu, it um, was thought to be. Um, what I, what I'm wondering is, what do you think uh, brought that into being at precisely the moment when, 
the political economy of the world was seen to be in uh, in crisis and also our own product. Mm -hmm. You know, like it it was not a natural fact anymore, but it had gone into crisis and could be in, you could start to explore why and, and all the the relationships that were setting that up. Um, And there was a return to Marx, which in, in a way, it was also a return to Rousseau, or ought to have mm-hmm. been. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. why, why did that return to Marx have these people be so popular? Right. Well, that's why I, I, I again would point out that um, you know, because I mounted my criticism of Badu from a Marxist perspective, and I think Bruno Bastiels was on a panel with me at the Left Forum, and he said, "You're really missing the point." Badu says he's not a Marxist; he's a communist. And, you know, he, he, he Badu thinks that Marxism is inadequate to what he's talking about. Um, and so why? Well, you could say, I mean, it's not that Badu has a notion that um, inequality is based in nature exactly. It's rather there's class society. And then there's this countercurrent to class society, which he calls communism. Right. So from the very beginning, I mean, it's, it's based on, you know, a kind of anthropology. It's based on, um, you know, Marx and Engels have this idea of primitive communism before the Neolithic revolution. You know, the noble savage of Rousseau's time, the hunters and gatherers, that uh, they exist in a state of equality in the sense that there isn't a class inequality. There might be a differentiation among people, you know, Engels famously called the hunting gathering community, the world historic defeat of women, because it's a gender division of labor. The men hunt and the women gather. Um, Although, of course, there were communities where women hunted, of course. But generally speaking, the character of it is throughout the world is that the men hunt and the women gather. But that's not class inequality, you know, you could say gender is the first form of class, perhaps. And there were other differentiations. They had shamans, they had uh, elders, honored elders, you know, they certainly observed differences among people. But there was no class hierarchy, there was no class inequality. So with with civilization, with settled agriculture, with the Neolithic Revolution, with the agricultural revolution, you get class hierarchy. And I think that for Badu, communism means overcoming class hierarchy, which doesn't mean overcoming individual difference. But I think he's unclear about that. And I think that class hierarchy remains the bottom line. And then Marxism is seen as just one passing historical manifestation of the struggle against class inequality, namely the struggle against class inequality in the era of industrial capitalism. But Badu, influenced by Mao's cultural revolution, thinks, well, we ought not to reify the proletariat. That's not the only form of class hierarchy, and it may not even be the central form of class hierarchy anymore. Right? So there's an enduring class hierarchy, and there's an enduring resistance to it, namely communism. And I feel like that just leaves aside the question of already in bourgeois society, I would assert there's a difference in class and caste. So the history of civilization is really a a history of caste hierarchy and that really it's the industrial revolution and the contradiction of capitalism that brings about class in the Marxist sense that the bourgeois third estate is differentiated between workers and capitalists. You don't have a capitalist class before the industrial revolution in Marx's sense. You have rich people, poor people, but you don't have a capitalist class because you don't have owners of the means of production. What you do in industrial capitalism because there were proprietors, there were merchants, there were people with money, wealthy people, there were privileged people, aristocrats, the church but the workers own the means of production. Whereas with the industrial revolution, there is an alienation from production because 
there's the generation of a possibility beyond the bourgeois social relations of production. The way Marx puts it is because the worker is alienated from the result of their productive activity, namely science and technology, industrial technique, general social intellect, because it no longer belongs to the workers, it, it can't be appropriated by them on the basis of their labor power as a commodity. It must belong to someone else, namely the capitalists. But really, it's capital. And then the capitalists are just the character masks. Right. And so really, capital is just self-alienated labor, meaning alienation from the result of production that has a potential beyond the existing social relations of production. So it's not about the capitalist private property and the means of production. It's not about the stock certificates. It's not about that. It's about alienated labor. And of course, you know that from the Marxist humanists, they're big on this. Capital is alienated labor. That's really the issue is to disalienate labor. Then the question is, well, how, how are we supposed to do that? And that's where the whole Marxist strategy comes in of seizing the means of production, the dictatorship of the proletariat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Meaning the workers would have to engage in a process of disalienation, of reappropriation of production on a different basis than we have now, namely labor power as a commodity, as a source of value. And that there is no like straight line about that, nor is there a clear, there's not a straight path, nor there, is there a clear path. We're gonna have to try different things. And also maybe getting beyond capitalism is about allowing different kinds of production to have their own social rationale rather than all have to be adjudicated in a homogeneous way in terms of labor as value and capital. Right. But that, I mean, to get beyond that, you're going to have to already have a political victory for the working class. You're going to need a political victory. You're going to need state power. You're going to need a political ability to allocate resources, set social priorities. I mean, we obviously have that now. We do. And yet, clearly, clearly not in an adequate way. Like, clearly, it's still crisis ridden. And clearly, it's only very partial, you know, the degree to which the state tries to manage production. It clearly is not. able to. Right. And no. And right. And the idea is that the working class, when they gain political power, since they are the source of the, the alienated labor, they will be able to overcome the limits of capitalism in a way that the intellectuals cannot or the, the politicians cannot. That's Certainly the, the hope. Can't. <laughs> Right. Um, and when we right. talk about seizing the means of production, one of the things that we have to maybe start with is re-seizing society as the general will. Right. That's right. And also realize that we are guided by that already in our in our activity. Um, we can we can be more or less conscious of it. And also it can rise to a greater or lesser political level. But maybe my, my other point, you know, uh, insofar as I've really set myself the task of rethinking the relationship of all of these things, bourgeois thought and Marx, and especially at a political level, recognizing that capitalism for Marx is a self-contradictory general will in a way that was not faced by people like Rousseau or Smith or Kant or Hegel, for that matter. Meaning um, capital, the easiest way to put it is there are two objective, structural, functional, operating general wills. One is to reproduce the conditions of labor to allow social participation in production and the justice that attends to that. That's one, the bourgeois general will. And then there is another general will, namely the will to accumulate capital, which is objective and structural. It isn't up to just greedy profiteers, right? It's, it's not, meaning their greed and their profit seeking is 
just a function of a greater societal need to accumulate capital. And it's not that we get rid of one and just have the other. It's not like restoration of bourgeois society. It's rather, how do we redeem capital accumulation? Right, because capital accumulation is obviously extremely potent as a social force. It allows for revolutionizing the means of production, still. And yet, obviously, happens in a in a much more destructive way than Marx and Marxism thought was necessary. Well, and listen, the, I want to go to the next tap. I want to go to the parrot room, um, huh? and and. And I in the second half, I mean, I think this conversation was great. And we got into, um, I think, pretty high mm -hmm. level theory or, you know, it, certainly we, we talked Marxist politics um, on a level that uh, wasn't being discussed back in 2010 by the right. RCP or Badu. Right. We were That's they right. weren't thinking this way. So I want to go back to the, the Maoists and the and Badu and Zizek in the parrot room and really look at the recent history on its own terms a bit more <clears throat> good so we'll we'll do that in the in the second half but um thanks everybody for watching you can join uh on patreon to uh to get the second half i'll put a link to it in the description um and um we'll we'll see you in two weeks and next time it will be vigi vigi fabio vigi on emergency capitalism If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.